you very much. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Traditional approaches to ancient Egyptian funerary practices are strongly shaped by Victorian ideas of a universal human quest for personal immortality, of which Egypt was thought to provide a paradigmatic example. Correspondingly, grave goods are generally interpreted as, interpreted as finished objects of immediate use to the deceased in his or her personal afterlife and where this for one reason or another appears intuitively unlikely, the objects are interpreted to tell us something about the exotic nature of the Egyptian afterlife. In this paper, I would like to discuss a particular category of grave goods, showing both how a new, broader understanding can emerge when the object is approached as an image in the making, and how such a new reading fits with ongoing research on ancient Egyptian ontology more widely. Hippopotamus figurines of Egyptian faience are among the most characteristic products of the late Middle, Middle Kingdom of ancient Egypt, circa 1850 to 1650 BCE. Ranging in length, in most cases from 10 to 20 centimeters, the figurines show a lone hippopotamus in one of a small range of characteristic poses. With very few exceptions, the surface of the animal is covered with painted designs depicting a variety of water plants and more rarely fauna such as birds, frogs and butterflies. Across individual examples, the patterns of decoration follow certain general principles, especially for decorating the head and rump of the animal, while more room for individuality on the midsection, while the, with more room for individuality on the midsection, which is where animals, birds and insects tend to be represented. In terms of their motif and material, the hippo figurines can be connected to a larger group of contemporary faience figurines of animals and plants, from which the hippos are set apart, however, by the characteristic surface decoration. Egyptian faience is a non-clay glazed ceramic technology used widely across the Mediterranean, Near East and Europe. The main material consists of a paste made from water added to the main ingredients of silica, soda and lime. This paste is modeled or molded into shape, glazed and fired. Glazing by the time of the Middle Kingdom made use of three different technologies which could also be combined on occasion. The most frequent is the method of efflorescence where the faience paste is mixed wet with the coloring material. As the object dries, the salt migrates to the surface and when fired, this layer melts and fuses to the object leaving a glaze the second method, cementation, involves burying the object in glazing powder inside a vessel. When the vessel is heated, the powder melts and becomes fused to the object, creating the glaze. The third and last method, application, involves the coating of the object with slurry by dipping or applying with a brush. Very few hippo figurines have been subject of the kind of detailed scientific analysis necessary to determine the precise glazing method but the data available generally confirms the expectation that because of their size and the combination with painted patterns, the efflorescence method would be preferred, possibly supplemented with application. For this reason, my discussion here will focus on the conceptual affordances of the efflorescence mode of production, but since a central point will stress the ambiguity of the inside and the outside of the shape of the hippo, my analysis remains compatible with other methods of glazing as well. The majority of hippopotamus figurines have no recorded archaeological context, and those that do generally suffer from the documentation standards of the late 19th and early 20th century. Most examples with a known provenance come from tombs, though more exceptionally, more exceptionally collections of faience figurines were deposited at temple sites outside of Egypt, and examples retrieved by Petrie at Lahun may originate from the settlement rather than the necropolis at that site indicating a wider use of the objects in addition to the predominant funerary one. In the vast majority of documented finds, it is possible at best to ascribe the objects to a particular tomb and associated assemblage, which can be helpful for dating purposes, but offers little clue to the precise manner and place of deposition. In a few instances, however, a more detailed description of the find circumstances has been published. This is the case on the one hand with the detailed description of the pit tomb of Ren Seneb in the Middle Kingdom Cemetery at Assasif on the Theban West Bank, excavated by Carnarvon and Carter in 1910 to 11. 
As part of the detailed description of the grave goods, the excavators note that a blue faience hippopotamus was embedded in the mummy wrappings at the small of the back. <coughs> at the position in close proximity to the mummy, though not apparently within the bandages, is documented in the much earlier publication by Auguste Mariette, who notes in passing that in two cases at Dra Abul Naga, also on the west bank of Thebes, hippopotamus figurines were found inside the coffin placed under the feet of the deceased. Judging from the information available, the faience hippos seem generally to occur alone, but more exceptional and more problematically documented examples <laughs> are known where they occur in a pair or as a, as a part of a larger assemblage of other faience figurines of animals, humans, and plants. Traditional interpretations of the objects have been shaped by the prevailing Egyptological understanding of grave goods as objects of use to the deceased in the afterlife. As Egyptian sources tend to stress the dangerous nature of the hippopotamus, this has generally le led to two competing explanations. Either the hippopotamus offers a victim for the deceased to hunt and kill in a gesture symbolizing the defeat of chaos by the forces of order, all the strength of the hippo was meant to be harnessed so that it could offer the deceased protection from hostile forces. The peculiar nature of the surface decoration is not generally considered in this connection or is simply noted as a representation of the natural habitat of the animal. However, I will argue that this incongruous element is precisely the key to understanding the ontology of the figurine. In doing so, I'm drawing on the idea expressed by Hinara Hulbrad and Westell in the influential 2007 volume, Thinking Through Things, according to which the material characteristics of objects should be allowed to set the terms of their analysis, seeking basically to subvert the intuitive distinction between concept and thing. In a concrete sense, the surface of the finished Egyptian faience object can be said to be located inside the paste whence it emerges during drying and firing. This efflorescence is already a powerful model in tune with Egyptian thought about creation as emergence from an undifferentiated primeval substance. We could say that prior to its firing, the prospective surface resides in a purely potential form distributed evenly throughout the molded mixture. However, by overtly identifying the surface of the figurine with an eye environment through additional painting, this idea gains a more precise articulation. In ordinary parlance, of course, the hippo is within and part of the aquatic environment depicted on the surface. And this is perhaps the most straightforward way to understand the decoration when simply viewing the figurine as a finished product. However, the figurine already resists this reading to some extent by the fact that the environment is not around but on the animal, a point to which we shall return presently. But when keeping in mind the process of emergence of, of the surface from inside the material of the figurine during production, the relation between the animal and the environment becomes decidedly ambiguous. Thus, in addition to the notion of the hippo in the Nile, we have the complementary idea of the Nile inside the hippo. This corresponds to two fundamental types of interiority as formulated by Viveros de Castro. One, meriological, a part-whole relation, where the outside encompasses the inside, as the hippo in the Nile. And one, ontological, relations constitutive of a mode of being, where the outside is imminent to the inside, quote, like the ocean swimming inside the fish, making it a figure of, and not just in, the ocean, end quote. In this terminology, the process of molding and firing the figurine thus conceptually comes to correspond to a move from ontological interiority towards meriological interiority. In faience figurines of other animals decorated naturalistically, this move is completed by creating a firm finished object with fixed shape and borders. However, in the case of the hippos, the identification of the limit between the interior and the exterior not just as the outward shape and skin of the animal, but also as the Nile environment, effectively stops the process short halfway between ontological interiority and myriological interiority. Thus, the object captures in, it, captures in its rigid, fired form a motif which cannot be read entirely consistently as either a statement about the hippo in the Nile, nor as the Nile and the hippo, but rather locating the relationship between animal and environment chronically unstably somewhere in between. 
We can approach the deeper ontological ramifications of this state of affairs through two different directions that I would like to explore briefly here. One is through an understanding of the decoration of the hippo figurines as effectively constituting a type of camouflage, drawing on recent work by Bertrand Prévost on animal camouflage as a matter of ontology. The other consists of an exploration of the use in the hieroglyphic script of a sign representing the head of a hippo to write the term art, best translated as impulse or moment, with clear connections to the set of ideas emerging from the hippo figurines. One way to think about the further import of the surface decoration is that, at its most fundamental, it can be understood as an instance of camouflage added to a species in which it does not occur naturally. The normal associations of camouflage as an aspect of appearance helping an animal to hide in a particular environment, however, do not appear particularly pertinent for the understanding of the hippo figurines. In a recent work, Prévost has argued a deeper significance of animal camouflage especially in what might be labelled its purest form, where the animal loses, loses its individuality, not just in relation to its environment, but in relation to itself. Instead of understanding camouflage from the point of view of an individual animal hiding, using one or more individual elements of the environment, Prévost argues that camouflage should be seen as a way of appropriating the surroundings, in this way, the loss of individuality becomes not just a perceptual, but an ontological matter, a way of becoming world by, quote, making a costume of the world or carrying the world on the skin, end quote. To return to the figurines, we can thus understand the decoration blurring the boundaries between the animal and its environment as a way of presenting the hippopotamus in a state of de-individualization, of becoming one with the world, in this way, the observed ambiguity between the inside and the outside of the figurine gains an ontological relevance. The figurine presents the animal at the exact point where it is neither fully individuated nor completely dissolved in the environment. As Alberti has argued, such apparent hybridity in an object may be understood in a sense where, quote, the forms are not static representations of a hybrid state, but rather are themselves a movement between states. End quote. Thus, the characteristic behavior of the hippo lying in the surface of the water becomes a striking image of an ontological state between the actual and the virtual and capable of moving in either direction. This set of conceptual affordances can be further illustrated by the use of the hieroglyph depicting a hippopotamus head to write the Egyptian term art, which, traditionally, which is traditionally translated variously as either moment or power potential, depending on the exact usage. This is naturally not the place for a fuller discussion of this concept, so I'll just give a couple of examples of the usage of the term to designate an ontological state like that captured in the hippo figures. The first example is from a funerary spell inscribed on the walls of royal pyramids in the last third of the third millennium BCE. The passage here is spoken by the sun god who is ready to be reborn by the goddess of the sky. The belly of the sky swells from the power, art, of the divine seed which is in it. Behold me, I am the divine seed which is in it. Here the word expresses the as yet mainly unrealized potential whose effects are starting to become visible by the swelling of the belly. The second example is from a more mundane description of an Egyptian who has lived many years in exile and who is cared for in the royal palace upon his return. Meals were brought to me from the palace three and four times a day, as well as what the royal children gave, without a moment, art, of ceasing. While we can best translate the term in such usages as a designation of time, the context shows that this is again a potential just on the verge of being actualized although in this case the point is that this does not happen. The servants might have stopped serving food, but they didn't. The connection between the behavior of the hippo and the abstract idea expressed by the term art is thus very likely to be found in the ontological ramifications of the hippo's ambiguous mode of being. This underlying experience of the hippo is masterfully captured in the figurines by drawing on the materiality and mode of production of Egyptian faience as well as adding the impossible camouflage to the, surface, to the surface of the figurine. 
At this point, it's time to return to the archaeological record for a brief consideration of what could possibly be the point of placing such an object within the coffin or among the bandages of the mummy. A short answer might be that Egyptian personhood is highly distributed, and one way to understand the function of grave goods at a very general level is as a means to secure through material means the intricate meshwork of social and ontological relations eliciting the new mode of being of the deceased as an ancestor spirit. A figurine capturing the exact moment between personalization and depersonalization, or vice versa, would be highly pertinent to the situation of the deceased and the deposition inside the coffin or even inside the mummy bandages indicate a concern with creating a being materially incorporating this particular ontological mode. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.